What AWS services do you need to know as a data engineer in 2024? Hey there guys, welcome back to another video with me, Ben Rogajan, aka The Seattle Data Guy. Today we're gonna to be diving into the services you need to know in AWS if you are a data engineer. We're gonna go over just a few, because honestly, at the end of the day, you only need to know a handful to really know probably 90% of the solutions you'll be using. Here is the list we'll be going over. We'll be looking at S3, AWS Lambdas, Redshift, Athena, MWAA, IAM, EMR, uh, and just a few others, including RDS and Kinesis Streams. So that way you get a good understanding of what all these solutions are and kind of how they function. Now, this is gonna be part of a larger series where I'll actually be diving into each of these individually. I've already got my Lambda one uh, put together, so you can expect some more so that you, as a data engineer learning AWS, know kind of which ones are worth knowing. Let's dive into a high-level overview of these very services, what they do, and how you might use them as a data engineer in your day-to-day. -day. Let's start with S3, also known as Simple Storage Solution. It was one of the first uh, AWS services that was provided. I want to say somewhere back in 2004, 2005, but essentially kind of as the name suggests, it really is a simple storage solution. It's just meant to hold whatever you feel like holding, whether that is a CSV, a uh, parquet file, an image, it can hold it. And it became very popular, especially for data engineers, when originally uh, data lakes became very big because it was this place you could store data in a way that you could then put some sort of query engine on top of it. But if you're a data engineer, you will probably use it for a few different reasons. One, again, you might have some sort of data lake that you've built uh, in S3, and that might be one initial option. But another way is that maybe you have an external partner or maybe you are pulling data from an external source and you're dropping your CSV or raw data files into a bucket in a folder. So this is very common. You'll be taking this data out. You'll be creating a bucket and a folder in that bucket with some reasonable structure to actually dump in that data. And then from there, you'll likely either ingest that data into something like Snowflake or Databricks, or maybe, uh, as we'll talk about later, use something like Athena to query on top of it. But it really gives you this whole plethora of uses that you can use. And again, we're gonna have a few uh, deeper dives in a future video. I'm gonna show you how to actually set up uh, Snowflake pipes that can actually pull CSVs exactly when they kind of get dropped in, as well as running queries using Athena. Next, a very popular service that most of us rely on is AWS lambdas or serverless functions. The reason being is that they're very similar to the way that you might have set up your old cron jobs where you might have had some simple scripts or even a more complex system developed in you know a few scripts that was then kicked off by cron essentially at some time uh, in the day. Lambdas essentially let you have these scripts uh, without having to revision an entire server, right? Like the other option is you could spin up something like a server, which is EC2 and have those scripts live there. Or you could just have these serverless functions kind of live uh, without any designated server to run them. And only when they need to be run, will you then essentially find some server that exists uh, that's all abstracted away. You don't need to worry about that. That will then run your script. Um, you can partner this with something called Event Bridge, which essentially runs very similar to Cron. It will essentially allow you to set certain timings or even have certain triggers uh, fire off events. So it's very similar to if you've used Windows Scheduler as well, to where you can set off events to say, hey, fire the script that either ingests data, like we said S3 earlier. If you drop a file in S3, you could have a Lambda actually trigger uh, when that file is dropped to then load it somewhere else. And so Lambdas are these really nifty scripts where if you don't have to have a whole system or or maybe you just need a very basic function to like pull from an API, you can create it uh, and just have it live there without uh, provisioning an entire server. So it's generally cheaper and more cost efficient because you only have to fire it once a day. No point in paying for an EC2 instance uh, 24 seven. Now those were kind of like the base uh, services that you'll likely use. They kind of build up a lot of other services that you'll likely rely upon or they'll kind of be the glue that you use uh, as you're doing various things. On top of that, another service you might rely upon is Redshift. Now Redshift's definitely one of my least favorite cloud data warehouses, but it's also the one that I came into. Uh, when I came into the data world, there was kind of this interesting transition period where there was a lot of people on-prem. So I was working on Oracle and SQL Server. There was a lot of Hadoop. So a lot of people were trying to figure out Hadoop, how to set it up uh, basically themselves or using something like Hortonworks. And then there was also Redshift. And so I spent a ton of time learning Redshift and how it was set up and how it was very nuanced, right? Like it does provide the benefit of being 
a cloud service so you can spin up a petabyte essentially data warehouse that's kind of the thing that they sold it as initially uh, that would be very functional and, and work really well in terms of being able to process these large data sets because again it is this cloud data warehouse that is essentially based on um, Postgres if you look uh, far enough back but it was personally at the time very tied still to some of the conventional thoughts of you know you'd often have to set up a certain size redshift instance so if you ever had to migrate you'd run into issues or there was always these weird things like instead of running a merge statement, like many of us might be used to, you'd have to do an upsert, which involved two or three tables, essentially just to try to both insert and update data at the same time. But it really was, I think, the first kind of cloud data warehouse that people started to adopt. I think BigQuery and, and Redshift came out around the same time. I'll, I'll put up a timeline here. Overall, you know, I, I definitely think Redshift initially had some of that market share uh, that a lot of people were relying upon it. And it's still heavily used today. Uh, Civics Analytics, which is a solution I've used in the past, uses it as their baseline kind of data warehouse. So you'll likely run into it uh, if you're on an AWS kind of team. But again, it's a full kind of blown data warehouse where it has compute, it has storage, and it's not separated, at least not in its initial form. They have come up with newer versions, but their initial form was very much uh, stuck into one system. That's different than Athena, which Athena, if you've maybe heard of AWS Athena, is another service you might occasionally run into which essentially is a serverless query engine, right? It actually really is just built on top of Trino and Presto, which is what Facebook released to be a query engine that often would sit on top in, in, in our case, on top of our HDFS file server. So you can essentially sit Athena on top of things like S3 and just query directly from S3. So there's no necessarily storage component. You can just directly query from various sources. And in fact, it even lets you run federated queries where you can be in other sources. You have to set that up correctly, but you can actually query from a MySQL instance, like an RDS, which is their relational database service. You can query uh, again from S3 and a ton of other uh, sources, which I'll put up here, which is very helpful. So you, you don't necessarily need to have all of this data migrated over or, or ingested with some sort of ETL. You can just query it directly, essentially from their data lake. So this was very popular with companies that rely on data lakes. So Athena is the serverless kind of query engine that doesn't require you to have everything set up. You can kind of pay for what you use versus again with Redshift, you're gonna end up paying for your entire server uh, as it's running. Now, another foundational component uh, that you'll need to know in the cloud is IAM or identity and access management. Whether you are the one having to set it up, hopefully you have a cloud admin, but you might end up being the one that has to set it up or you're just the person that needs to work through various issues. You're gonna get these errors that pop up that say, you know, you don't have access to maybe put a uh, file into that S3 bucket. Then you're gonna need to know, hey, that's likely something I need to change and update either a policy or grant me some rights that I don't currently have. So you'll go through the process of literally creating things like policies and user groups that can then provide essentially access to various services on some fine grain level of control. You can literally go to the, to the point where you can say like, hey, on this bucket, you have the ability to put uh, files in, but in this other bucket, you only can read files. So it literally lets you get down to a pretty granular level of control on terms of what you should have access to and what you can actually even do once you have access. I've already referenced RDS or relational database services uh, before, but that is also a very common solution. You may not have to work with directly uh, unless you've built your whole data warehouse on like a Postgres instance, which I have seen. But more than likely, you'll have sources that exist often in these relational database services, which AWS essentially allows you to pick from a plethora of various databases, whether it's MySQL uh, or uh, Postgres, even things like SQL Server, you can actually spin up in these relational database service uh, setups. So that way you can actually be running them in the cloud and often support your application through these services. Again, you can set up your, your data warehouse uh, using something like Postgres or even SQL Server. Uh, but I think a lot of people prefer picking a like cloud data warehouse when it comes to finding the right data warehouse in those cases. So more than likely you will be extracting data from these databases, uh, meaning you might have to set up some things like uh, whitelist approval for your IP address if you're trying to extract data, uh, if you're using a tool, especially something like Estuary or Fivetran where you will have to extract that data. Or even if you maybe have a Lambda that you're using to extract that data, there might be some need to you know whitelist that Lambda and where it's running from, especially if it's in someone else's actual uh, virtual private cloud or their actual private network. So little things you will have to know along the way. These next three services, I think I see occasionally, but because of various reasons, like other solutions that exist, I see them kind of use less frequently. So things like EMR or Elastic MapReduce, which essentially allows you to have a managed instance of Hadoop or Spark or another similar solution without you having to set up all again, all of the complexity of spinning up your own Spark 
cluster or set of spark clusters. The reason I don't see this used as much, I think anymore is kind of re reducing down is because some people are just going straight to Databricks or something else that is a managed service essentially for something like Spark. But EMR still definitely exists and people do rely upon it for running some of their more complex uh, data transforms and maybe some of their machine learning processes. And again, it kind of just lets you have a managed version of, of Hadoop and Spark. And then Kinesis Streams uh, is kind of similar. You can kind of think of this similar to Kafka to a degree. The Kinesis actually has a few different uh, functions that it lets you have. Kinesis Streams is one of them. Essentially, it allows you to process data uh, and, and run analysis on a stream of data very easily. It really is a platform for streaming data on AWS, and it offers a ton of powerful services that make it just easy to uh, load and analyze streaming data while also providing the ability to kind of build uh, custom streaming data applications on top of that when required. So you might be just running queries on top of it or extracting data from it, but there's a ton of, of, of use cases that people might uh, have here. Again, you also might be using something like a managed Kafka instance or, or Confluent. There's a ton of other similar solutions out there that do exist. Um, these are just common solutions that you'll hear that likely as a data engineer, you will need to know as you're trying to learn more about the cloud. And again, we're gonna make a deeper dive in some of these uh, services. So do watch out for that because I wanna make sure that you don't just understand them from a high level, you can kind of see how they are used. So I'm working on a Lambda one right now. Hopefully that's gonna be uh, out uh, in a week or two after this one. But with that guys, I wanna say thanks so much for watching this video. Hopefully you learned a little bit about the services you should know if you plan to be a data engineer working on AWS. And we thank you guys so much and we'll see you in the next one. Thanks all, goodbye.